O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down city and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought far off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I free from, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thou be and lead me, and thy right hand shall behold, shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee.
are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I wake, I am still with thee. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we pray this morning as we worship you, Lord. God, that you would search our hearts, Lord, as we sing this last song, God. And help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name.
know our thoughts so far away, oh God. You're acquainted with your ways, Lord. Thank you for your precious blood that you shed for us. Thank you, Lord, that you uphold us. You keep us, Lord, lest we fall and dash our, dash our foot against the stone, Lord. Thank you that you're able to uphold us, God. Through all that we go through, Lord, you're going to hold us fast. It's not simply us trying to hold ourselves, God. You're the one who's able to keep us from falling, Lord. And you're the one that makes our feet like hinds feet, Lord God, as David said. And Father, we pray, Lord God, that we would keep our eyes upon you, Lord. We would look unto you by faith, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, we love you and we thank you this morning for your presence here with us, oh God. And Lord, we believe that you've come to meet with us, God. It's not just people gathered in the building. It's people gathered in the building in the name of Jesus, Lord. You promised to be in our midst. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. And God, we thank you for being in our midst, Lord. We need you, Lord. I pray every other thought that would distract us, God, would be cast down. And every thought that we have would be brought captive to the obedience of Christ. God, I pray give us eyes to see you by faith this morning, Lord and ears to hear you. If there are any here that don't know you, they're not born again, God, that today would be their day of salvation. Today is their day of salvation, Lord. And I pray they'd be born again this morning, God, and give their lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful to see you here this morning. You can be seated. We're visiting with us for the first time. We're glad that you're here. We actually have some visitors' cards. If you would fill one of those out for the service, you can put that in the offering plate in the back uh, today as well. I want you, if you would, to uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. I do remind you, we'll, have the, we'll be reminding you between now and then, but our time of prayer and fasting starting a week from tonight. Here in the prayer service through the following Wednesday in our time of street evangelism. We'll give more details about that. The Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. Amen. We want to be wise and share the gospel with, with others and bring them to Christ. Isaiah chapter 40. Read with me, if you would, verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 40, 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, and carry them into his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. The Bible says that the Lord is our good shepherd. We're going to talk today about the Lord being our shepherd. Okay, so in our series that we're doing, this is the 10th part, okay? And we're talking today about Christ being our shepherd. We're looking, the whole series is called The Ministry of Christ. And we've talked about who he is and, and what he's done and what he did and what's finished and what he continues to do and what he's going to do one day as coming king and as, as judge of the earth. We've talked about him being the savior of the world, the propitiation for the sins of the world. Talked about him being our healer and our sanctifier, our comforter and our advocate at the right hand of the Father. Today we're talking about Jesus Christ. Very clearly he's portrayed in scriptures as the good shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 that we were like sheep going astray. We as people were like sheep going astray. But now are returned unto our shepherd, the shepherd, and bishop of our souls. That's Jesus Christ. Same thing in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way. And the Lord has laid the iniquity of, of us all upon, upon him. Upon him the iniquity of us all. That is a good picture. It is a picture. It is a parable. Anytime you talk about Jesus Christ being the door or being the, uh, the pearl of great price, it is a picture. He's not actually a door with hinges and a doorknob. He is the way. Okay, I, I am the door by me. If any man enters in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. It's the, it's the way he saw fit to describe himself to us that we would understand. Okay, 
but we are we were like sheep going astray but there's one good shepherd and we have returned by the blood of Jesus to that good shepherd and he shepherds his people we just read if there's a day coming okay Isaiah is speaking about a future day when he's coming to rule and his reward is with him and he shall feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs with his arms. He's a good shepherd, amen? He's a good shepherd. He's not just like any other shepherd who, who doesn't care for the sheep. But Christ uh, shepherds his people, and he shepherds his people. He will shepherd his people. The last two weeks we've talked about Christ as the coming king. He's coming to set up an actual kingdom on this earth at the end of the tribulation period. He will end the tribulation period himself when he comes, ride on the white horse and put down the enemies of Antichrist and so forth and establish his kingdom for a thousand years on this earth. And he will reign and rule and he will judge. But he will judge righteously and he will judge in mercy and he will judge correctly and rightly. That's the last two weeks. But he's also, when he comes, going to actually shepherd his people. That's what he's said it says here he will do that he does that now but there's coming a day where he will shepherd on the earth as he reigns and rules and the word shepherd okay literally means shepherd all right it means shepherd and it means pastor though it means shepherd and pastor so when we're looking at christ being our shepherd and the good shepherd we also are looking at how how does he shepherd us now if he's really actually at the right hand of the Father, how does he shepherd his sheep who are still on this earth at this time? Well, we have the Holy Ghost in us. Okay, we have the Word of God by which he leads and guides us. But God also in his mercy and grace gives us pastors. He gives people with his heart to shepherd his people. He's still the good shepherd overall. But he does give people to shepherd men, to pastor the people of the Lord. So he is the shepherd, the Bible says, of our souls. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, David said in the Psalms. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We see this all through the Bible. It's a great picture. It's a great picture. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. What we sang about, he's the savior of the world, the healer. He's all of these things. That's why he calls himself these things. That's why he reveals uh, through the Bible to us himself in these different ways. And he is the shepherd of his flock. And as born again people, we are the sheep of his pasture. We are part of that flock. And so he is our guide. He's our caretaker. He's our defender. Amen. And he shepherds his people. I want to just read this scripture very quickly. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, this is in Ezekiel. It's prophesying the return of the Lord. Not his first coming, his second coming. David, my servant, Jesus came in that lineage, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. He's actually called in the scriptures, the Lord is, the shepherd. He's called my shepherd. He's called the shepherd of the sheep, the one shepherd. He is called the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. In the Bibles, he's called that. And again, he reveals himself in that way to men. He wants us to know him that way. For God, this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Amen. He's the shepherd guides. That's one of the things that the shepherd does. He guides his flock and he guides his people. And again, he wants us to know him in that way as a good shepherd. Thou shalt guide me with counsel and afterward receive me to glory. So I want to talk this morning about Jesus being our shepherd. And we can't talk about Jesus being our shepherd without going to John chapter 10. So turn with me. To John chapter 10, if you would. Looking at the ministry of Christ. And this is a wonderful ministry of Jesus for us. A blessing for our lives. Amen. We're going to read a lot of this, this chapter. So just stick with me. We'll start at the beginning. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief 
and a robber. But he that entereth in by the, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and, sh and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, for they, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep, for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, who own the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf cat catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I believe that's speaking about Jews and Gentiles being brought in together, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Amen? Okay, it's very clear in Scripture that Jesus is called, I am the good shepherd, he says. I am the good shepherd, and what makes him the good shepherd specifically is he's the son of God, and he laid down and lays down his life for the sheep, okay? So what, what, there's a lot that's in that passage that we read. I'm not going to talk about all of it, but one thing that I see very clearly, if Christ, one of his ministers, ministries to us, is being our shepherd, and our good shepherd, and the chief shepherd, and the bishop of our souls, he is contrasted in this passage between, there's a great contrast between the good shepherd and the hireling. Good shepherd and the hireling. And I want to talk about this for just a moment, okay? It's specifically in verses 12 and 13. What the, the hireling is just what you would think a hireling is. Not necessarily anything wrong with the hireling, but it's certainly not the good shepherd. The hireling simply means a hired servant or a wage worker. He's a wage worker. So what the picture is, you've hired someone to tend to the sheep. And remember, it's a parable. It's a picture, okay, of Jesus and the flock, all right, the people. But you've hired someone to take care of your sheep. You say, I'll pay you so much per hour, so much a day or a month or a year. You take care of those sheep and watch over them. When their time's over, they walk away and somebody maybe leaves them or spells them for a while. But... They have agreed it's worth it to them. You pay me X amount and I'll do that. I'll do that. And so they're a hired servant. Again, nothing wrong with that, but they're not the good shepherd. And the contra uh, contrast to two, look at verse 12, 13. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth. How, how simple is this? The hiring fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. He's just a hired hand. It's worth this much money that we agreed upon, but it's not worth my life to defend those sheep. I'm fine with this amount of pay. We agreed upon it. We shook hands, and I'll do my job, so to speak. But if it comes comes a point, those aren't my sheep, and it's not worth it to me to fight off a wolf, a bear, a lion, and so forth to protect one of those sheep or many of those sheep. The hireling fleeth. That's what he does. He flees when he sees the wolf coming because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Why doesn't he care for them? They're not his own. The good shepherd owns us. Amen. He bought us with his blood. He loved us when we didn't know him. He shed his blood for us when we didn't come to him and didn't know the Lord. 
he, he, there's a, quite a difference between the two. And I'll say this, and I'm, I'm going to relate throughout this message, God shepherding his people, also to the shepherds that God's chosen to shepherd his people. Because he has chosen uh, men and raised up men to shepherd his people. And so pastoring, that's, that's another definition of the word shepherd, is a pastor. Pastoring should never be just a job, ever. It shouldn't be for me, it shouldn't be for any pastor. It should never just be a job, I mean, vocation. It has to be, and it's not always this way, but it should be, it must be in the Lord's eyes, a calling, a calling of the Lord where he makes that pastor, calls that pastor and makes that pastor, amen? And that shepherd of his people. And so I'm going to just real quickly look at some scriptures. You don't have to turn to all these. I've got many of them written down. I'll tell you where they're coming from. But just to see in all ages, the those that have been in positions of spiritual authority, pastors, shepherds, that have not been called. They've not been called by the Lord. They've taken that upon themselves. And I just want to read this. I'm going to read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the three major prophets, okay, in the Old Testament. All deal with this in detail. I'm going to read, I'm reading this from Isaiah 56, 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs. Talking about the false shepherds. Which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Everyone for his, his gain from his quarter. Jeremiah says, for the pastors have become brutish. And have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper. And all their flocks shall be scattered. What a difference between these. And the good shepherd. Listen to this from Ezekiel. He really gets into detail. Detail about it. And the word of the Lord came to me saying. Son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them. Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel. That do feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flock? Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you sought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty ye have ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep, this is important, my sheep, my sheep, my sheep. The Lord has redeemed all of us in this room with his blood. We belong to him. If we're saved, we're his sheep. Yea, he says, my sheep wandered through the wilderness and mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. This is important to the Lord. Having a good shepherd for his people on the earth to shepherd people is extremely important to the Lord. It's very important that he says of himself, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. Jesus, it says when he came out, I'm reading from Mark 6, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. It's important to the Lord. He began to teach them many things. He probably it was important. He said, look, look at the people. They're just wandering. They seek after this and they seek after that. And they think maybe this and maybe that. And what's the way? Show us the way. And, and Jesus was moved with compassion. Not just because they were sick and hurting and lame and so forth and hungry. He said they're like sheep. They don't have a shepherd. They're just wandering around. And he was moved with compassion. And it says he began to teach them many things. I think that's interesting. When, they, when he saw that they were sheep without a shepherd, he said, let me teach you some things. He gathered the people together and began to teach them. This shepherd mentality, being a good shepherd, is very, very important to the Lord. So we see it. We see that there are uh, false prophets and false pastors and false teachers. And this sermon is really not about that, but we have to claim that. We have to talk about it because it's contrasting between a hireling and also contrasting between a bad shepherd. Okay? 
uh, of, a, of a human being that, that claims to be a pastor and is not. But there are false teachers. There are men and women claiming to be of God. There are impositions of leadership. I'm not here today to mention one name. I'm simply saying they are within. It's nothing new. Okay, it was Old Testament. We read three Old Testament prophets all dealing, God dealing with the same thing. And even more so in our day, it's in, there's an increase. But they claim to be of God. They're in the church. They're within the church. And they claim that the Lord is with them. And that they're speaking on his behalf. They're operating in his name. And yet the Lord is against them. There are shepherds that the Lord is against. And their only desire is to make merchandise of the people. It's for some type of selfish gain of their own. It could be for popularity. It could be for uh, to be lifted up. They like being lifted up and riding the crest in the wave of the people. It could be for money. It could be for notoriety, fame. It could be for power. They like the power that they exercise. They can literally lord it over people. There's different reasons. There's different reasons, but none of them are good. That uh, someone be a, a false prophet and not the true prophet of God. Amen. The true pastor and shepherd of the sheep. What's the difference in the good shepherd? Well, a lot. There's a lot of difference between the good shepherd and the hireling, specifically who we're talking about. He's not a hireling. Jesus Christ is not a hireling. And so he shepherds his people. The sheep are his own. He shepherds us because we're his own. And he loves us. And the Bible says that when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, right? And God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep because we're his sheep and he loves us and he cares for us and we, we belong to him. He loves us. The Bible says in that passage we read in John chapter 10 that he cares for the sheep. He knows the sheep by name and is known of the sheep. There's a relationship, a personal relationship, not a, just a mass of humanity. It is personal one-on-one. -on -one. He knows his sheep by name and he calls them out by name. And he is known of his sheep. We have to know the Lord. Uh, you can be a part of a church that doesn't make you born again. It must be born again, amen. And Christ must personally be our shepherd. What does it say about the good shepherd? He loves the sheep. He knows them by name. He calls them out. He calls them in. He warns them. He calls them to himself. He leads them to safety, to pasture, to still waters. He watches over his sheep by day. He watches over his sheep by night. He, he fights off the wolf, the bear, the lion, the thief. He doesn't drive his sheep. He leads them. He says he leads them out. He opens the door and he walks out and the sheep follow. That pastor needs to set an example in his life. Number one, his life and how he lives it. And in his course, in his speech and the sermons and so forth. And he needs to not just push people and say, y'all need to go out with this. Y'all need to go do some stuff out there and get busy for God. The pastor needs to lead. The pastor talks about the altar. The pastor needs to be at the altar. You understand what we're saying? That he leads the sheep. And and. He doesn't just drive them like with a bull whip or a cattle prop. They're not cows, they're sheep. And the sheep know the voice of the shepherd and they follow. Okay? And he leads his own sheep and calls them out. Amen? So uh, he knows us by name. And it's a great cost to himself. Great cost to himself. The hireling says, no, he makes a judgment. The hireling says, my life, a lion. Okay, those sheep, see you. I'll find another job, right? That's what the hireling says. Jesus lays down his life at great cost to himself. It's sacrificial love. Greater love had no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. The Lord Jesus Christ has already laid down his life on Calvary, and he has proved his love towards us. Now, I want to talk for just a moment. We've talked about the hirelings. We've talked about the, the false the false shepherds or the bad shepherds, but it's important to the Lord that a shepherd, a pastor, that he's called, that we have, that that pastor or that man of God has a shepherd's heart. That is the difference. 
hireling has a hireling's heart. He might love his kids and would die for his children, but he's not dying for their sheep. They're not his own. And so, but the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And God is, it's important to the Lord that his shepherds that he calls have that same heart. Have that same heart. It's important to the Lord. Not necessarily that the shepherds that he calls are the, the wisest of all, or the smartest of all, the biggest, strongest of all, but they must have his heart for his sheep. They have to. If God's ever going to call someone in this room, and I pray to us to be a pastor over God's people, you have to have God's heart. He will impart it to you, but it's a must. And don't shepherd God's people until you have the shepherd's heart for the people. Don't do it. It'll be a great mistake. Amen? God gives that. The Lord gives that. We see some types of that in the Bible. I want to talk about Moses and David just very quickly. We see types of good shepherds. Now, the types and shadows of Christ only go so far. They're only types and shadows. They're not the actual. Jesus is the good shepherd. So we can find flaws and problems and sins in David and flaws and sins in Moses as well. And the, the scripture shows it to us. But overall, as a pattern, they're a picture of the good shepherd. Moses carried those people. That's, that's how the scriptures describe Moses carried a bunch of rebels, for the most part, to the promised land, to the break of the promised land. He carried them 40 years and bore them. And when they sinned against God and sinned against Moses, he was still their shepherd, even though they were sinning against him. He hid his face and began to intercede on behalf of the sheep. God have mercy upon them. Don't wipe them out and start a new nation with me. God actually suggested this. I know good and well, I believe, that, that God knew Moses' heart that he wasn't going to go for that. Moses, let me wipe all those rebels out and start a new nation with you. And he says, oh, Lord. Don't do that. What will people say about you? They're going to say you weren't able to bring them in. You couldn't care for them down in the wilderness. God, don't for your name's sake, don't do that, Lord. That's a shepherd and a shepherd's heart. Time and time again, they rebel against Moses. Bam, he hits his face. They rebel against Moses and Aaron. You, Moses, brought us out here to kill us in the wilderness. And so did God. Bam, he hits his face before the Lord. He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. He does lay down his life for the sheep. Amen? And so he literally was a shepherd. You know that after 40 years in Pharaoh's house, basically growing up, the next 40 years after he killed the, the uh, Egyptian taskmaster there, he spends 40 years as a shepherd in Midian tended sheep. You say, what a, what a waste of a, a man like that. Shepherding sheep for 40 years. He wasn't a waste. God was making him shepherd of his people. He was 40 years, 40 years. Here goes one going astray, Moses. Go get him. There's a little one about to fall over the cliff, Moses. Go get him. Bring him back. Stupid old sheep going off again. Water's this way. He's going that way. The bear's that way. The sheep's walking right into the bear's mouth. You got to help him, Moses. And, and he gathers him back. He's making a shepherd. He didn't know he was going to be used at that moment to lead God's people out. God knew it. And he was making him a shepherd. It, was, it wasn't just all the excitement of coming out of Egypt. It was 40 years leading a bunch of rebels through the desert. And he had to prepare them for, him for that. And he did prepare him for that. He's called the shepherd of Israel. David, same thing. He wasn't the first king, but he was the king. Amen. Saul failed. The Lord made David king. And he made an eternal covenant with David. Jesus Christ came and is going to reign on the throne of David. He came through that line come again as king of kings and kings through that line. David was as a young boy, the age of some in here, was out on the hillsides shepherding the sheep. He, he, he took ownership of them. They, were, they mattered to him because that's what he was called to do. Your job, David, is to watch over those sheep. And he took it seriously and God put in him a shepherd's heart. I just want to read this. We know the, the passage. And David said unto Saul, this is when Goliath is threatening the armies of Israel, the big Philistine. And everybody's shaking in their boots and nobody wants to go out and fight Goliath. David said unto Saul, thy servant, speaking of himself, kept thy father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him. He was just a teenager. 
and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote and slew him. Thy servant slew, slew both the lion and the bear. Well, he prepared him for something, hadn't he? And this filled uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, and he would deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. What did David have? Even then, God had put in him a shepherd's heart. He did lay down his life for the sheep. Now, God spared him, but you understand the point. He hazarded his life to go after us. One little sheep, how much can that be worth? You know, he took a lion by the beard and killed it. Now, God had to give him the strength to do that. No doubt about it, but it was in his heart to do that. And he says, the Lord delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, out of the, mouth of the paw of the bear, and he's going to deliver me out of this 10-foot giant giant's hands as well and, and Saul says go get a tiger you know the, good good for you the Lord be with you and the Lord was with him but God had put in him a shepherd's heart and we see that with Moses and also with David again that's extremely important to the Lord I can't over emphasize that and God is going to give he is that shepherd but he is going to give and gives people like that and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. How about that? The Lord cares about the people that are pastoring his, his sheep because he's the one that purchased them. And if anybody's going to pastor my sheep, he has to be someone that I put my heart in to pastor the people. People jump ship this. This job pays more. Let's take that job. You know, just jump uh, in, in ministry. People, people do that. It just needs to be where God has called us and placed us. Could be the biggest church. Could be the littlest church. Could be a, a different church tomorrow. But it has to be God's heart for the people. Uh, when Paul, Paul had a heart. He was not a pastor, but he was a. a, a an apostle of the Lord, and he raised up churches, and he, he was weeping. It was the last missionary trip he had been on before he went back to Jerusalem, where he would be arrested and finally, ultimately come to, to be mourned in Rome. But he, he was with, gathered with the believers at Ephesus, and he says, For this I know, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. There are going to be grievous wolves that come in. And Jesus said, the hireling sees the wolf coming and it flees. But Jesus doesn't flee, amen? And the good shepherds that he puts in those places don't flee. So let's talk about it just real quickly. What is our shepherd guarding us against? He, you know, we, we read in the parable basically about a wolf. We read with David, a lion and a bear. There were literally lions and bears coming against the sheep. Who and what is after us? Well, the, very clearly the Bible tells us that Satan is our adversary. That's what the word Satan means. It means adversary. He is against us. He is opposed to us. He is an enemy of our souls. And he is after us. And Jesus said the thief comes not only for one reason, to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's in the context of what we read about sheep and shepherds. So he's in wanting to steal sheep. He's wanting the sheep to be scattered. He's wanted the sheep to be uh, destroyed, to steal, kill, and destroy. He's an enemy of the sheep. But, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, who resists steadfastly in the faith, the Bible says. And so he is that. Don't, don't pretend he's anything other than that. Again, I think it's a shame when people... Uh, I think it's an arrogance to, to talk about Satan in such a way that he's just some toothless, uh, you know, powerless being. He's not. He's not. Greater is he that's in us than he is in the world. Christ in us is greater. There's nothing we have to fear about the devil. But at the same time, to imagine that he can do nothing and that we don't have to resist him at times. And we don't have to be careful uh, because... 
the Bible tells us to resist him in the faith. Be sober, be vigilant. We have to be on guard is what I'm saying. We don't fear the devil. And we don't fear being overcome by the devil. But we don't ignore. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. He has devices. He has plans. And he's fashioning his plans of what would work best against you. And what would work best against you. Now none of them have to work. Because we can turn to the Lord in everything. And we can abide in Christ. And he can't touch us. Understand that. But we have to abide in Christ. We have, we're not ignorant that he's out there and he is after us. Amen. And so what does he want to do? What does he want to do in the life of the believer? The good shepherd keeps us from or protects us from. The devil wants to uh, steal, steal away and destroy the people of God. He wants to scatter the sheep. He wants to wreck your life. You say, well, I'm, I'm in Christ. Well, you are in Christ. But if you get your eyes off Jesus and get off in this world... He can wreck your life. He's trying to tempt you to sin. He's trying to get you to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. He wants to wreck your life. He wants to ruin your testimony for Jesus. He wants to steal your joy and peace that the Lord has given you. He wants to divide you from you over here and scatter the flock. Divide you from you. He desires to do that. We have the responsibility to guard against that. We have the responsibility to guard against that. Parents, he wants to steal your children and make a part of this world, this world system. He wants to have them. He wants to have your children and take them. He wants to steal your usefulness for Christ and for the kingdom of God. Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to have you and sift you as we. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. What is he after? He's after your faith. He's after your faith. He wants to get us, bring us to a place where we don't believe anymore. The good shepherd is greater than our enemy. Just like David was able by the Lord's might to kill a bear and a lion and spare the sheep. Our good shepherd is able to do that in reality. He watches over our souls. He's not a hireling. He doesn't flee when the wolf comes. He gives us warnings. He gives us discernment. He guides our steps. He leads and guides us. What does he defend us from specifically? He defends us, strengthens us against all the attacks that the enemy brings against our lives, against accusations. He is the accuser of the brethren, right? The accuser of who? The brethren. And I say this because I know it's true, but some of the accusations he brings before God against you and against me are true. He can bring true accusations. That's why we need to be quick to repent and confess because it's under the blood. They say, yeah, Randy did do that. But I've already forgiven him. That's under the blood. Say, you can go. He brings false accusations. He brings true accusations. He has schemes and plans against your life. He has specific temptations that he thinks are going to get you to sin. And he has temptations to get us um, to lead us away from the Lord. To lead us away from the Lord. He, he, ultimately, I believe that's what he wants. He wants our faith to fail. He wants us to come to a point, even after 20, 30, 40, 50 years of knowing Jesus and walking with the Lord, we come to some point, we throw in the towel and we walk away. It did not have to happen. It doesn't have to happen to one single person. Our walk with Jesus can get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And, sweeter. and it ought to. Amen. But it can happen when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we kind of get away from the good shepherd, we're not abiding in Christ, and Satan said, there's one, and he wants to pick us off. And our faith could fail, could, could fail. Thank God he's a good shepherd and watches over us, amen? But how does God lead us? Well, he speaks to us. He calls us by name. You and I, and I'm going to bring this to a close, but you and I need to come to a point, I say this all the time, I say it for myself, say it to the boys at Parkview when I teach the Bible study, uh, you need to come to a place where you clearly hear the voice of God. You hear His voice, you know it's His voice, and you're not confused as to whether or not that was God. But that sounds almost impossible. I've never heard God speak. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. He's speaking right now. He's speaking by His Word. Amen? He can speak by the Holy Spirit. He gives you leadings and guides us. 
Get up and go share the gospel with that person right now. Well, Lord, I don't have time right now. Get up and go share the gospel with that person right now. You can't hear the voice of the Lord, but you and I need to come to a place where, where we're dialed in, so to speak, where that, that frequency is dialed in and we're hearing the Lord, okay? And you can do something about that and so can I, okay? And it's spending time in His Word. I think that not the only way, but the greatest, most clear way that God speaks to us is by His Word. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so, I've heard it described this way. A lamp would be like just a little Coleman lantern you're holding out around the middle of the woods at night. It's just lighting up about 10 or 12 feet around you so you don't trip on something, right? It is, it's a lamp unto my feet. To me, it shows me the next step, the next, next step to take real closely. I don't step on that log or in that hole. But it's also a light unto my path. So it's shining way down the road. As far as I need to go. So it's got me lit up right here for the here and now and the momentary decisions I have to make and this is best and this is not and the whole direction of my life. You're going this way. You're going with Jesus. You're not going that way. You're not going with that way. You were like sheep going astray, but now you return to your, your bishop, shepherd and bishop of your soul and his word is lighting up which way to go. The whole direction. So we're not confused and we don't get off track uh, in, the, in the short term or in the long term. God never speaks to me. Yes, he does. If, he does. if we feel like he's not speaking to you or to me, then we're not looking to his lamp and to his light. Because he most certainly does speak to us. You say, well, that's just a book written hundreds of years ago. It's his living word. And there's nothing else like it. And it's forever settled in heaven. The words I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. And he has given it to us. And I need to avail myself and exercise myself to it and feast upon it, amen? And exercise myself to godly. If we're not hearing the voice of our good shepherd, then, then we need to go to his word. We need to get on our knees before the Lord, amen? He, he desires to speak to us. Maybe you're listening to some other voice that you shouldn't be. Some other pastor, some other something. But the Bible says that... Uh, that Jesus, that when he died and rose again, it says he, he gave gifts to men in Ephesians 4. He gave gifts to the church, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. So I will say this, God, for the godly pastors he's raised up, that is a gift to the church. Whatever church, whatever pastor, that's the legitimate one that the Lord's called. And that is a, a way that God speaks to his people. Not the only way. But that, that minister, but that pastor, bring in the word. But he calls us, he calls his sheep by name. He said, Abraham, Abraham. He had said, Samuel, Samuel. He said, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? He calls us, and we hear his voice. And I'll just ask this question as we'll bring this to the close. Do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? And I would even say this, those have been saved for many years. Do you know his voice better now than you did when you first gave your life to Christ. I would pray so. You can. It's not just for, oh, that's just for the prophet. You know, that's just for so-and-so. He speaks to us through his word right here. And he speaks to us by the Holy Spirit, leading us in the light of his word. Amen. And he can speak to our hearts. The closer we get to him, the more we, we know his voice. And I'll say this, do you know his voice and can you distinguish it from another voice? You know, you know, when Jesus, uh, after he rose from the dead, he was appeared to his disciples, I think, at least three times in that 40-day period before he ascended. Peter and John and James and all of them were out fishing on the boat. They looked on the shore and some uh, children, do you have any meat with you? No, we hadn't caught anything. And John goes, Peter, it's the Lord. He recognized no matter what, that's Jesus. Amen. We need to be able to recognize the Lord when he's speaking to us. And I need to be, be able to differentiate and say, this is Jesus, and this is not. This says it's Jesus, but this is not Jesus. I need to be able to distinguish between the Lord and another shepherd or another something that might be a tool of Satan or even my own flesh, okay? My own flesh that, 
that would move me to do something contrary to the will of God. Just for the, the safest, absolute most safe standard, how do I really know if it's God? It has to line up with this. I know I say it all the time, y'all, but if you say, I really feel God leading me to, uh, to leave my husband and to go be a missionary in China. You really believe that? Yes, I just feel strongly about it. Your, your husband a believer? Yeah, but he doesn't want to be a missionary. <laughs> okay. We well, all need to pray and get that settled. God's not leading you to leave your husband and to go to China to win China for Christ. Because <clears throat> I could go to other scriptures that would, would tell me differently from that. Okay? I'm just making up a, a, an extreme example. A lot of times we'll, we'll feel really spiritual about doing such and such. And it, if what we feel strongly about, no matter how strongly we feel about it, no matter how many people tell us, yes. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, then you throw it out. Just throw it out. It, it, it makes it real simple, doesn't it? His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He leads us and guides us. We need to be able to distinguish between the Lord's voice and another voice. And God gives us those, those people. I'm going to bring this to a close. <coughs> Turn with me if you would your Bibles to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Let's say the Lord is leading you not only do you able to, to hear God's voice and distinguish it, but I will say this, do you obey it? What if, what if a sheep in the sheepfold in John chapter 10 and, and the good shepherd was saying, here comes a wolf. And he, he's right behind you. Come over here by me. Come over here by me. And this sheep clearly knows that's his shepherd telling him that. But he just doesn't feel like doing it. That sheep's going to say, you know what? My shepherd told me that's a wolf coming. That don't look like a wolf. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. I think he's wrong about this one. Could be a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? The shepherd saw and recognized the sheep didn't. All I have to do is obey the voice of my shepherd. I don't get an argument with him about it. Somebody comes into this church or any church and and they're seeking to bring division, but at first they look like they're so kind and wonderful and, and, and somebody warns you or your pastor warns you or somebody the, the Holy Ghost warns you and said, that's, a, that's someone to be, watch out for. They're coming to sow discord or sow a false doctrine or something. Oh, no, I don't believe that. No, this, this is so-and-so. No, he is going to give you the shirt off his back, nicest guy in the world. We need to listen. We need to heed what God gives us, okay? That's important not only to distinguish the voice of the Lord, but to heed it. So let's read this in, in Isaiah 49, verses 9 and 10. That thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pastures, pasture shall be in all high places. They shall no longer hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. If indeed you could come. And I just want to thank the Lord for, for being our shepherd, our good shepherd. We see examples of the bad. We see examples of the false. I'm not giving you any names. Nor do I feel led to today to, to do that. I'm simply making the point we have a good shepherd. He's not a hireling. He's not a bad shepherd. He is a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Last scripture I'll read from Hebrews 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, and will be glory forever and ever. Amen. He's that great shepherd. Amen. I'm very thankful that he didn't just save us and leave us to our own devices. He didn't save us and leave us to fight off wolves and lions and bears and false teachers and prophets and the devil himself and the schemes of the devil. He's with us, and greater is he than us. 
than he is in the world. He is a good shepherd. This sermon is not to make you afraid of the wolf or the, the thief that came to steal, kill, and destroy. This, this, this sermon is to let us know we have a good shepherd. Follow him. Amen? Listen to his voice. Follow him and heed him and heed his word. Amen? The altar's open. Let's just come and worship the Lord for a few moments this morning before we go. Father, we bless you this morning. God, we thank you. We were as sheep going astray. That was us. But now have returned unto the good shepherd, the bishop of our souls. I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you for protecting us. I thank you that you lead us in and out. You don't drive us, God. You lead us, God. I thank you, God, that you make your voice known to us to where we can know this is Jesus and this is not. I thank you for being a good shepherd and caring for the sheep. Thank you for caring for me. I thank you for the wonderful pastors through the years and even now. Wonderful godly men and women and people that you've raised up, men that you've raised up to shepherd your sheep, Father. And I pray you bless them. And I pray you bless other pastors that are doing what's right and seeking to do what's right, God. That you would bless them, Father. In Jesus' name.